I'd like to draw everybody's attention to what I think are two principally destructive myths in the whole uh, realm of drug policy and what's called um, the war on drugs. The first is that if you're dead, you're dirty. If your body is found hanging from an overpass or discarded in some barren field with the various rituals of drug land violence done to you, you know, you've got a bullet through your head, your hands are bound behind your back, you've been tortured, you've been dismembered, a message has been written in blood on a poster board and left on your chest. If your body has been, you've been killed in this way and your body found in public um, with this kind of theatrical display of violence, then the assumption, the working assumption is you did something to deserve it. You were somehow involved in the game, right? The, the, ter the phrase is most often used in Spanish, en algo andaba, right? Um, in fact, in, in Mexico, the Mexican president, Felipe Calderon, has said in repeated interviews, it's also part of a federal attorney general's report, um, PGR report, that, quote, some 90% of the people who have been killed in the past five years of drug-related violence were somehow involved in drug trafficking industry. So that, that statement does two things, I think. First off, exercises incredible violence of the assumption of guilt. Um, because the real fact is, well, first, Calderon has offered no supporting documentation, no study, no government um, office or independent university or non-governmental organization uh, analysis to support that number. He just says it, throws it out there, and walks away. Um, and there is, in fact, no evidence to support it. But another number is rigorously documented, and that is the fact that the Mexican federal government investigates only about 5% of the homicides that have taken place in the, fa in the past five years of drug-related violence. So that means 95% of somewhere between 43,000 and 50,000 murders are not even being investigated. So if the murders aren't being investigated, that means guaranteed impunity. Impunity, again, meaning that no one is ever held to account for the crimes. No one stands before a court of law, before a judge or a jury to um, be tried in uh, you know, what would be considered due process fair manner. No one is ever held to account for the crimes. So the murders take place, and no one stands before a judge, much less um, is sentenced for the crime. 95% of the murders, guaranteed impunity. So how can someone say 90% were involved if no one's investigating 95% of the murders? No one knows. And so it's a guesswork to say 90% are involved. And it's a guesswork that exercises, I think, incredible violence because it posits the assumption of guilt, which subtly tells the society not to be outraged, not to be upset at all this violence, at all this murder, to get used to it, to see it as something normal because you get used to seeing the grotesquely displayed mangled bodies, this mass of death, and think, pues en algo andaba, right? They were up to something, they were in the game. They somehow deserved it. Why, we don't need to investigate, much less demand justice, much less demand a change in policy, because somehow they deserved what happened to them, somehow they were guilty of their own death. Um, what this does is it strips the humanity of all the victims. They become just anonymous bulks, masses of death, you see the images on television screens, on magazine and newspaper front pages, full color, glossy photographs of all of this you know, sensational and theatrical display of anonymous death, of death without name. There's no history, there's no personhood to the people displayed in this media representation of violence. It's just death itself. And so again, no clamor for justice because there's not a person there. You don't see a person with a name or a history. You don't feel morally outraged because you just see anonymous death and get used to it. Um, <clears throat> in the, the book I wrote, Ted mentioned, is called Today in Mexico. That, that is a quotation of a political cartoon published in 2010 in the newspaper La Jornada by Antonio Elguera. And the cartoon called Morina Mexico is a graveyard scene. It's um, a very working class graveyard. The, the tombstones are basic stone and wooden crosses. And instead of names on the tombstones, names and dates, people who had, who had passed, what you read are things like, en que se hubiera metido, que hacía estas horas, era puta, vestía provocativamente, right? Um, era un ajuste de cuentas, in English. Um, I wonder what they were up to. She was a whore. She dressed provocatively. What was he doing out so late? 
it was a settling of accounts. So it's all the logic of the war is that if you're dead, you are guilty of your own death. And that serves to justify um, the overwhelming regime of impunity, the overarching climate, political climate in Mexico of absolute impunity. No investigations, much less any kind of trials or bringing to justice of the killers. The second myth, again, this first one is the, the myth of if you're dead, you're dirty, you somehow deserved it. The second one is um, that this, what's going on is a war of good and evil, a war of good people versus bad people, of good guys versus bad guys. And this is the subtext of the entire United States dogma of drug prohibition, which seeks to criminalize and stigmatize drug users and also drug, you know, sellers, um, you know, colloquially called dealers, but, you know, we'll get to this. The, the, I think we should look at drugs as just a major global industry and start to use the same terms for drug, the drug world as we do for the soda world, the cigarette world. Um, but in the myth, it's, it's good and evil, which is, you know, very much the discourse used by Bush in the war on terror to create uh, a population condemned to the violence about to be unleashed upon it by their very nature. They're evil, they're terrorists, right? This was the Bush logic to try and drum up support for an illegal invasion of Iraq. Something very similar, I think, is taking place right now with um, with the Mexican war on drugs. And something Diego's gonna go into in great depth is the idea that the war on drugs is really a cover for a political crisis inside the Mexican state. Um, but the myth here is that it's good and evil. The Mexican government spent this year 180 million pesos um, hiring the national, uh, largest private national television company, Televisa, to film a TV series, not a commercial, but a series, something like The Wire or 24 Hours or one of these, you know, new fangled kind of, you know, multiple episode television series. And this one was about the Mexican federal police force and their um, fight against drug traffickers. And the, the title of the series in Spanish is El Equipo. Ellos saben que el bien vence al mal, right? Which in, which in English means the team, they know good defeats evil. They tried to hide the fact that the government was paying for this television series until the newspaper El Universal broke the story and then they had to fess up. But this is the message that the Mexican federal government wants to tell the population to the tune of you know, investing 180 million pesos in creating it. It's a war of good versus evil. I think that vision is profoundly mistaken and again is a, is a mythological vision that exercises violence because it prohibits any kind of deep understanding of what's happening. What is happening? In the past four and a half, almost five years now of President Felipe Calderon's administration and his so-called war on drugs, somewhere between 43,000 and 50,000 people have been executed in absolute impunity. But that's not all. So that, that right there, those are 80 to 100,000 parents who lost their children. You know, 100 to 300,000 brothers that lost their siblings, brothers and sisters. You know, families completely destroyed. The violence isn't only locked in the individual who's killed, but spreads out through the family and the social relations of that person. But that's not all even that. Extortion, kidnapping, mass kidnapping of migrants from Central America on their way to Mexico, human trafficking, sex slaves, forced labor, um, cattle rustling, all manner of violent crime in Mexico has exploded as kind of one of the snowball effects of this presidential militarization strategy to combat illegal drug trafficking, or supposedly to combat illegal drug trafficking. So those are the two myths that I think we need to be aware of and combat, not believe. When we hear them, when we start to notice now, you've you know, heard this, or you, most people in here probably actually recognize this already, but you see officials on television, everything from police chiefs to mayors to presidents, kind of put forth this logic, well, you know, they were in the game, or they were involved, or somehow they were dirty. You know not to believe that. Um, and then also the idea that this is really a war of good versus evil. This is some kind of moral battle. It's not a moral battle. It's very much a political battle. And I'd like to thus offer quickly um, a different way of looking at the entire world of transnational drugs, drug industry, and the political regimes with their so-called you know, wars on drugs. 
The United Nations estimates that between 350 and 500 billion dollars in cash a year are generated by the global black market in drugs. In any city in this country, 24 hours, seven days a week, you can buy meth, heroin, pot, and cocaine in both powder and crack forms. In most cities in this country, you can buy any of those drugs in any neighborhood. These are drugs that are available all the time, almost everywhere, to the tune of generating 350 and 500 billion US dollars in cash a year globally. This is an industry. This is an industry that is extremely lucrative, is extremely well organized, incredibly efficient, um, with a vast and complex network of production, shipping, transportation, distribution, and sales. Um, we need to move away from the soap opera vision of the drug world as this kind of shady underworld that only takes place in the shadows that involves capos and carteles and dealers and pushers. And it's all these kind of dirty, um, you know, stigmatized suspect figures of the shadows who, you know, are pushing these toxic substances on innocent children at schoolyards and stuff like that. That's not what's happening. That may happen in individual cases, but systematically, that's not what's happening. What's happening is a major global industry that's humming and is doing good business when most other sectors of the economy have been racked by the fallout from the 2008 speculative capital crisis. In fact, the United Nations issued a report in 2009 saying that they detected an estimated 320 billion US dollars of cash successfully laundered into the banking system, the global banking system in 2008, end of 2008, beginning of 2009, effectively keeping the banks afloat. The very time when speculative capital crashed epicenter in the United States and the whole real estate crisis. And the banks were on the verge, many banks fell apart, but uh, the huge global banks, Wells Fargo, Chase, Citibank, were on the verge of collapse. They desperately were in need of liquid capital, cold hard cash. It was the drug industry apparently that was able to provide um, a kind of lifeline or support system. And there you can think of the global drug industry as a kind of savings account for capitalism. It's like a, a reserve bank account that is there in, in moments of capital crisis. Why? So global, let's, you know, we've established, I think, the fact that it's more lucrative or more productive way to look at the whole global drug world as a global industry. The defining feature of that industry, I think, is the illegality of the commodity. The fact that the commodity is illegal immediately creates an incredible price mark, raw coca paste in Colombia. That paste is refined into powder and that same kilogram transported from Colombia to Mexico, from Mexico over the border of the United States, goes from a thousand. And that value is created simply by the process of shipping. Nothing else is done to it. It's not like in the United States, we grow a special plant that has to be added to the coca plant to make it good cocaine and thus the value is added by something special in the United States or the United States is better coca powder refineries than in Colombia. No, all the refining is done south of the border. The value is created by the shipping over the borders. Illegality creates the value. The risk of getting the commodity over the border creates that incredible value markup. Um, but illegality imposes on transnational Ill illegal businesses a major constraint. And the constraint is that you can't ship it openly. You can't ship it in a way that it can be seen. So when you ship the commodity, particularly when you ship it over a border, you have to do so in such a way that it's invisible, that it's officially invisible. States are manic about documentation, especially documentation of their borders. They're manic about looking through your backpack, checking your papers, where were you born? Is your visa up to date? Is your passport up to date? You know, like states, every single person who goes across, and the things they take with them, every time we go through an airport, every time we walk across a bridge, um, we're under scrutiny. How then could enough drugs to supply every city in this country get across the borders so consistently that they're available every day of the week? Um, only way is, I believe, for the transnational drug corporations, illegal drug corporations, to have employees inside the structure of the state at pretty much every level on, every, on both sides of any international border. 
So there's the perception that corruption takes place. Yes, okay, now we can talk about corruption. There's corruption in Colombia, there's corruption in Panama, there's corruption in the Mexican police forces. It's now kind of okay to admit that. It wasn't okay 10 years ago when the Mexican police forces were getting caught torturing human rights uh, defenders or indigenous rights or indigenous movements. Then, you know, the police were, you know, law enforcement. But now we're talking about drugs. Okay, we can kind of admit that the police are corrupt, but the army isn't. All of that stuff, I think, remains entirely <coughs> in the realm of myth. It's not corruption. Corruption makes it sound like they're just these individuals who get seduced by money, want to buy the big pickup truck, or have the newest plasma screen TV, and so they fall to the seduction and the power of money and sell out. Maybe that happens, but I don't think, again, that explains how so much product gets so efficiently um, across international borders into every major city in the United States, but also in Europe and other countries throughout Latin America. Illegality imposes invisibility. Invisibility becomes a major investment for the illegal drug businesses. I heard actually um, a renowned Mexican journalist just in Mexico City, Pepe Reveles, say in a, in a conference this past weekend, we were both in Mexico City, that you know the DEA estimate of how much money drug traffickers in Mexico earn every year is between 30 and 60 billion US dollars a year, just for getting the drugs over the border. That number is entirely suspect. I think it's probably much larger, but it gives us an idea of the scale, right? This is a major industry. In fact, if it were between 30 and 60 billion US dollars a year, that would make illegal drugs the largest single source of cash in the Mexican economy, larger than oil, larger than tourism, larger than the remittances that migrants send back to Mexico. Um, and Pepe Revela said that, and this is right, I, I didn't catch the write down, I need to look it up, um, but that there was a study saying that 40% of that 30 to 60 billion was spent on um, buying off government authorities. So this is a major business expense, right? This is a major, like, kind of think of it as like the advertising budget of the illegal corporations. Since they can't advertise because their product is illegal and has to be invisible, what they have to spend that money on is the direct employees inside the structure of the state. It's not corruption, it's business. And it's business on both sides of the border. It doesn't only happen south of the border. The United States likes to constantly export the perception of chaos to other countries. Uh, you know, Colombia is the chaotic, violent, corrupt place. Mexico is the chaotic, violent, corrupt place. That's entirely bogus. This is a global economic system um, in which the international drug trade is embedded and the same structural constraints um, imposed on a country like Mexico, the direct participation of people inside the state to get the product over the borders, also are imposed inside the United States. Um, but if this is this illegal industry, um, the product has to be constantly invisible from public view, get over borders, so you have to constantly hire people inside the structure of the state. But the state, at the same time, is waging this so-called war on drugs. They have this massive publicity campaign saying that drugs need to be illegal, and we need to be tough on crime, and drugs are related to crime, and so we need to have this war on drugs. So to sustain all of that publicly, they need to constantly produce arrests. Arrests become a kind of sub-commodity inside the global um, narcotics industry. Um, the state becomes addicted to arrests in the same way that a user becomes addicted to a substance. Um, to justify politically and socially the amazing expenditure on police, prisons, um, border enforcement, military training, the incredible deployment of resources in the war on drugs has to be sustained publicly or supported publicly through the perception of success. How are they going to create the perception of success? Because drug use is only ever up. The drugs are only ever available. There's no success whatsoever in a 40-year war on drugs in the United States in stopping the availability of, uh, of illegal substances in the United States. So they create the perception of success through the constant production, um, manufacturing, if you will, of arrests. So if arrests become the kind of, you know, uh, substance to which the state is addicted to, how do they produce them? Who knows, who has actual information about where drugs are grown, where they're shipped, where they're distributed? The people who do those things, the shippers, the growers, the distributors, the sellers. And thus, in the illegal drug market, global illegal drug market, information 
becomes another little sub-commodity. If you actually, if you have information about where someone's moving a product at a certain time, you can sell that information to the state. And the state will acknowledge all this publicly. The DEA, the CIA, people make huge payoffs to informants, right? And they justify it as like, this is how we get the information. But if you step back and look at it, kind of a global, almost world systems theory analysis, that means information is constantly a commodity inside the illegal drug industry, which means, or is a way of understanding one reason why constantly see drug trafficking uh, organizations or corporations fracturing and splitting and warring with each other um, because people constantly sell information about the movement of product, constantly move allegiances and sides. Also, if, if your product is illegal, um, then if somebody jacks your load, somebody steals your product, you can't call 911 or you know, go to the police department and file a complaint that somebody took three kilos of coke from your house. You know, since you can't go to any kind of formal um, conflict resolution source, whether le you know, inside the state court of law or a nonprofit you know, organization conflict resolution specialist, since you can't go to these people, the conflict resolution method of choice has become violence, principally murder. Um, which means murder will constantly be another overhead expense of a global illegal industry. If your commodity is illegal, violence will constantly be a part of your industrial activity. Now, we need to be careful there and not get caught in the government myth that if you're dead, you're dirty. I don't think you can move from if dead, then involved. You can't do that because you don't know what happened to this individual, who their name was, you know, what was their life if you don't investigate, right? So you can't make that move if dead, then involved, but you can make the move, I think, if the commodity is illegal, then people will die. Violence will be a part of the industry. Um, and that's kind of the, the hopefully very brief, because I want to leave a lot of time for Diego, kind of sketch of a way of looking at the global drug industry that I hope can step us a bit, help, help us step back from just good and evil, good guys, bad guys, stigmatized um, myths of the of the trade and say let's take a more sober look pardon the pun at um or just kind of dry analytical vision of how this stuff gets where it gets consistently how the state can constantly be arresting people and yet nothing ever stops why it's so much money but then there's also another another facet and this is again if we if we ask the question who benefits from the illegality who benefits from having a constant war on drugs. The people in the business, unless, you know, there's a significant amount of risk because, you know, there is a lot of violence in the business, but the people in the bu business benefit economically from the, the incredible po profit markup that illegality creates. But the state also benefits because the drug war discourse becomes an incredibly successful pretext for institutional forms of violence. In the United States, the drug war has been from its earliest inception, um, an instrument of law used to oppress migrant populations, people of color populations in the United States. The first ever ordinance banning a drug was in San Francisco in 1875, banning opium. And it was part of an entire package of legislation that was developed in the late 1800s, explicitly designed with like directly racist intent to exclude the Chinese migrant population from economic success. In, in the early, you know, kind of post-gold boom era of, of um, the development of California. Consistently throughout the history and during the whole prohibition drive of the 19 um, teens and 1920s, each drug was linked in a propaganda campaign to um, a people of color population, marijuana to Mexicans, cocaine to African Americans, opiates to Chinese Americans. Um, and there was just this explicit, um, propaganda campaign to racially stigmatize and, and justify thus the criminalization of the substances, racially stigmatize the users. Um, there's an excellent book called In Pursuit of Oblivion by uh, uh, a British historian journalist, Richard Davenport Hines, um, that traces, I think, in a, a very eye-opening way, this whole, the history of the development of the prohibition regime in the United States and its earliest um, uh, 
kind of development in relation to prop very racist, explicitly racist propaganda campaigns. Fast forward, there's, there's a recent book that just came out by a woman named Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow, The War on Drugs in the Age of Mass Incarceration, where she focuses on the argument of how in the 1960s through the Nixon era, late 1960s, mostly 1970s through the Nixon era, um, anti-drug legislation served to reproduce Jim Crow era segregation laws um, through anti-drug laws. So you had a disproportionate targeting of both the design of the laws, famously, you know, you had, this later came in the 80s, but um, a five to one disparity in uh, penalties for pe possession of crack cocaine versus powder cocaine, the exact same substance, but crack is used primarily by working class folk and people of color. White powder cocaine was primarily associated with upper class white folks in discotheques. Um, it's the exact same chemical substance, the exact same alkaloid, but you could get five years, or I think it was like a five to 100 disparity, right? So you get five years for powder and you could get like, you know, almost life in prison for crack. Um, the three strikes your laws, three strikes your outlaws as well, compounding all of that. But Michelle Alexander's book shows how drug laws have been deployed in the United States constantly as a form of social control and racialized social control explicitly. Globally, the United States drug laws have been used repeatedly as forms of, or, or as pretexts for kind of neo-imperialist -imper intervention in other countries in the hemisphere. Um, very famously, the Iran-Contra scandal, right, where you had the CIA directly organizing with uh, cocaine traffickers to fund the Contras in Nicaragua to wage a counterinsurgency war against the left-wing Sandinistas. Um, so here, you know, a very direct, and then also using the anti-drug prohibition discourse and law um, to provide counterinsurgency support, support to Colombia and its civil war against the FARC um, to justify constant interventions throughout the, the region. Um, locally in Mexico right now, and this is what Diego is going to go into in much greater depth, I think, so I won't do too much, but just to put it in with the same analysis of how the in the United States, drug policy has been constantly linked to racialized forms of social control, neo-imperialist intervention in the region. In Mexico right now, the drug war um, discourse as well as the very real military uh, strategy of, of supposedly combating drugs has been a pretext to cover up, hide, evade a very deep political crisis in Mexico 